Uh, first of all, I'd like to announce that we're going to have a happy hour next week uh, on Thursday at about 4.30 p.m. at Republic. Now, chances are most of you are planning on being there anyway, so I guess I'll see you there when you like or not. Uh, so today I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Blackman the South Texas College of Law. And he's the author of the book Unprecedented, the Constitutional Challenge to Obamacare. And he will be discussing, as you might have guessed, the legal challenges to the Affordable Care Act. Also here today is Anthony Sanders of the Minnesota Institute for Justice. That's an organization dedicated to protecting civil and economic liberties. And he'll be offering commentary. So this will be more of a discussion than a debate. And so any of your comments are strongly encouraged. So with that, please join me in welcoming our speakers. All right. All right, how's everyone doing? I have like, there, I've had to like shed like a snake as, as I cross through from the hotel. Uh, I, I, I teach at the South Texas College of Law in Houston where it's a bomb 75 degrees right now. Not the climate. So what are we talking about today? Okay. Obamacare. And I need to make actually Three branches of our government colliding over the meaning of the Constitution. Okay, this was a case where every aspect of our government was conflicting over whether Congress can do one thing: force people to buy health insurance. Okay, that this is the nature of the case. Does the Constitution give Congress the power to compel people to buy health insurance? Okay, so a little bit of background: health insurance is very expensive, uh, um, uh, and We've had a long history of trying to make it more affordable. So, my litmus test, right? Who knows what this picture is? This is Hillary Care, right? The Health Security Act. So this was an attempt by the Clintons in the early. Commercial. Oh, yeah, yeah. Anthony? that was run in the early 1990s. And it was this Midwestern mom pop sitting on the table saying, you know what? I, why? I don't like this Clinton health care plan. Because I like my doctor and I want to be able to keep my doctor, right? So, Hillary Care went down in flames, but a lesson was learned here that we should keep in mind. Any effort to reform health care in America must be premised on letting people keep their doctors and letting people keep their insurance plans, right? That was a core promise that had to be made to sell this law. And the promise was made, you know, anyone who knew anything about healthcare policy that wasn't impossible to keep. But anyway, that promise was made. So we fast forward, and there was no real effort to reform healthcare reform on a broad scale until President Obama was inaugurated in 2009. All right, another, another trivia question. Obama and Roosevelt, FDR, share a record with respect to inaugurations. What is it? Ooh. They share a record. Think about it. Yeah. They've each taken it four times, right? So, 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 so count with me, right? <laughs> First time, Obama and the Chief Justice, they flub the oath, right? So they do a do-over the next day in the White House to make sure he's actually president, right? Okay. Fast forward to 2000. Stripped out. No one even mentions that anymore. Now it's just Affordable Care Act, ACA, or the word that I'm going to use is Obamacare. Now, 
a brief second on why I follow Obamacare. And I labored on that term because a lot of people consider it pejorative. Some people consider it racist. Um, I've heard everything about it. But you want to know who likes that term? Or maybe I say liked that term, Obama. So after the Supreme Court upheld the law in NFIB, uh, Rolling Stone interviewed the president and said, would you be happy if historians call this law Obamacare? You know what he said? I'd be proud. Okay, so at least in 2012, he was proud of the term. Fast forward to 2013, that word is verboten, okay? If you actually look at his Facebook and Twitter page, they stripped every single reference to Obamacare. I, I have the screen caps, they were there, I promise. So right around October when the law launched, every reference to Obamacare in the entire social media platform was just eliminated, gone. So now, now it's just ACA, right? But I guess if it goes well, it'll become Obamacare again. So, you know, it, I think it's related to how well the law is doing. But I'm going to call it Obamacare because he said he'd be proud for historians to call it, and I will, I will do my best to honor his, his, uh, his intents, at least here. So, what do we have? Is the Affordable Care Act constitutional? So we need to explain a little bit about how the ACA works. Now, this is a big bill, but there's only one key provision that we're going to be talking about now, which is the individual mandate. So the way health insurance works, like anything else, is it measures risk, right? Some people are more risky than others, and like insurance, if you're more risky, you pay more money. And the way the ACA works is saying we need to lower costs. So how do we do that? By putting more people into the insurance market, young and healthy like you, we can even out the risk pools and have all these young people paying to the insurance market and not get anything out of it. And then we have these sick people and poor people who can't pay as much getting more services. Right? It's meant to spread the wealth and equalize health insurance. That's how the Affordable Care Act works at its heart. It's about making it more expensive for some by making it less expensive for others. Okay? It's redistribution. That's how the ACA works. But how do they make sure that all these young invincibles like these people in front of me today actually enter this market? This is what's called the individual mandate. You are penalized for not having insurance. Congress says you shall maintain insurance. That's the word in the statute, shall. We all know shall means must in the law. You shall maintain insurance. If you don't, you pay a penalty. That's called a penalty. Okay, so the question is, can Congress make you buy a commercial product, right? Does Congress have that power? And this is the constitutional debate. So what was interesting about the uh, constitutional challenge for Obamacare and maybe our friend in Super Justice can talk about this, was how social movements and popular support ginned up um, support for challenging this law. Right? This wasn't just a challenge that came from the law professors. In fact, law professors laughed at this challenge. This was really a challenge that came from the people and Randy Barnett. Uh, but you know, this is a challenge that came from the people themselves in form of the Tea Party. Now, the Tea Party opposed the ACA um, not just because it was bad policy, certainly they opposed it as bad policy, but they opposed it because they, they said it was unconstitutional. I remember I saw one Tea Party rally in Washington, D.C., where a guy had a sign that said, overturn Wicker D. Filbert, right? <laughs> I didn't know Wicker D. Filbert was until I got to my second year of law school. Here we have people actually opposing this law on its face because of the Constitution. And the Tea Party grew and grew and grew until you had tens of thousands of people marching on Washington saying, enforce the Constitution, <clears throat> obey the Constitution. Congress does not have this power. Uh, and this was remarkable in and of itself that you had this constitutional movement sprung up really out of almost nowhere, focusing on killing one law, Obamacare. <laughs> but the political opposition would not be enough for one very important reason. In 2008, the Democrats cleaned House. They had 60 votes in the Senate, right? And when you have 60 votes in the Senate, what can't you do? No filibuster, right? Actually, I need to thank all of you people, because who was the 60th senator seated in 2009? Franken, yeah. So, so if Al Franken lost, we would not have Obamacare. Uh, I, that, that, that's a pretty fair statement. So after Al Franken was seated and the Democrats had a 60-vote caucus, the president made the decision to go at this on a straight party line vote. He was intent to say, just get all the Democrats lined up. Don't worry about the Republicans. We'll worry about it later, right? <laughs> yeah. So that was a strategy for hiring the Senate. Get all the Democrats lined up, we'll pass the law. So this is the actual... Affordable Care Act, because they want to know how many pages this law is, at least when it was first written. They want to guess, threat numbers. 2074. Holy, God, that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, 2,700 pages. Yeah, yeah. Good answer. I've never had anyone get the right number. Yeah, <laughs> you get a prize. I don't know what that is, but you'll get a prize. So, tw basically 2,700 pages, okay? The actual final bill was released in, the, in its final form roughly the second week of December of 2009. And the Senate scheduled a vote on Christmas Eve of 2009, roughly three weeks later, okay? 
Why did they schedule this vote? Well, it wasn't meant to be the final vote. This was just meant to be a test vote to get all the members of the caucus on record saying, we support this law. There were a lot of bugs and kinks and errors, but they said, you know what, we can work this out later, right? Okay. So no one actually bothered reading the ACA before they voted on it. Mean, it's not like it's an important piece of legislation or anything. It doesn't really impact people. But they just passed this, written mostly by lobbyists behind closed doors, only now finding out what's in it. As Pelosi said, you have to pass the law to find out what's in it, and, and boy, we're finding out now. So they passed the law. And So everyone's saying, yay, we got Obamacare, we're done, okay? But then something weird happened, right? So this is Senator Ted Kennedy, and he had died that previous summer, okay? Who replaced Ted Kennedy? Scott Brown. Scott Brown, my God. Let me put this for your perspective, right? <laughs> Scott Brown ran on the promise of being the 41st vote to stop Obamacare. That was the only thing he was running on, and that's why he lasted one term, right? He's not, he might not be the senator of New Hampshire, probably know. Anyway, so Scott Brown, a Republican, ran on the platform of stopping Obamacare. He took Ted Kennedy's seat in Massachusetts. A Republican replaced Ted Kennedy in Massachusetts on the promise of stopping. Oh my God, right? This is stunning. This was a testament to how unpopular this law was, right? In Massachusetts, for crying out loud, right? Where they invented Romney Care. You actually put a Republican in office to stop the Affordable Care Act. Stunning, right? We forget about this, but this is the history of how this law was passed. This is not making sauces. So sausages is like civilized compared to this. This is how do you want to talk? It's like a slaughterhouse, okay? So where, where do we get? Well, we all know school has rocks for you know a bill to become a law to pass one house, got passed the other, and then go to the president. So in theory, if the Democrats want to do the you know constitutional thing, they will simply just pass the bill in the Senate, okay, send that to the House, and then the president signs that to law. Right? That would be we'd expect them to do, but they couldn't. Because remember I said this wasn't the final version of the bill, it was only a draft. They hadn't finished writing the damn thing yet, okay? So, what's the problem? Let the House make changes and send it back to the Senate, right? No. The second they send it back to the Senate, it'll be filibustered to death, it'll be killed. So, what did Speaker Pelosi decide to do? Who here has ever heard of the budget reconciliation? Yeah, yeah. I had never heard of it either before law school, okay? So, the budget reconciliation process says, basically, is if you have a budget, which means something that raises revenue, and you have a version in one house and a version in the other house, you can have a, a committee or a conference that can kind of iron out the kinks, right? But the key thing is that committee is not subject to a filibuster. In other words, the house can pass the whatever changes. So this didn't end run around the filibuster, right? They made it as a revenue raising bill, which it really wasn't. It's not supposed to be a tax. I'll get back to that later. But they use this budget reconciliation process. So they did this bizarre thing where they effectively voted on a version of the bill the Senate never passed. <laughs> then they passed a different version of the bill, sent it back to the Senate, and the President signed that. This is like schoolhouse rocks on crack, okay? This is, this is not how the most important piece of legislation in like 50 years should be passed. But this is what they did, because you know what? We got passed a lot to find out what's in it. We'll figure it out later, right? No big deal. So what was the vote on the ACA in the House? So two numbers to focus on. First one's this one. You have 34 Democrats across the aisle. A cover by Pelosi you said you can do it because you had enough votes. But a lot of these who voted yes, Democrats, were swept out of office in the 2010 midterms. This is when the Tea Party kind of swept through. But the more important number, I move my thing fast enough, I can make a zero. Is that, yeah, I can never do it right. That goose egg, right? Zero Republicans. You need in mind when we're talking about Obamacare. When this law was passed, 49.7% of Congress opposed the law. Half of America did not want this. Four years later, okay? When you have half of the country invested in a law's defeat, for better or worse, I mean, you could just say the Republicans were being just jerks. They were being obstinate. They didn't want to support anything that Obama wanted to do. Fair enough. But you still have an actual law that half the country hates. That's not a formula for successful health care reform. I gave a talk yesterday William Mitchell, and the, uh, the person commenting was, uh, was a health policy analyst who said in, in Minnesota, you have something called Minnesota Insurance or Minnesota Care or something, and apparently your state has spent 20 years ironing out the kinks and figuring out how to provide health insurance for all of Minnesotans. What do you call it? 
Minnesotans. Minnesotans, right? Okay. But this was a process that people came. This was jammed through on a straight party line vote, really at the dead of night of Christmas Eve, because they had to do something. We'll have to worry about later. This is not a recipe for success. And as tough as it is to implement Obamacare, half the country wants to shoot it down. Okay? So that's the frame. Anyway, so after all this budget reconciliation uh, process, it finally goes to the president. And kind of a cool thing, the president, see all these pens over here? He has these 23 commemorative pens, and he signs part of his signature with each pen separately. So each stroke is a different pen, and he hands them out souvenirs. Um, he signs it, and he made some statements to the effect of, uh, this was March 23rd, 2010, so roughly four years ago. The president said, the battle over Obamacare is over. The battle over health reform is over. He said, this is it. This is the law of the land. That was four years ago. The battle was just getting started, my friends. And the first front in this battle was neither than the fundamental law of our land, the United States Constitution. Was this mandate constitutional? Okay. So let's do a mini con law lesson, which I'm sure, have everyone taken con law? Good, good, not everyone has. All right, so what case is this? What, which case is this? I actually don't answer. <laughs> which case is this? Wicker v. Philbin, what do Wicker hold? Uh, that you can aggregate commercial uh, things that aren't necessarily going into the stream of commerce. Right. Okay, so this was a key New Deal case, right? So this is farmer Roscoe Filburn. He would grow wheat. This is an awesome picture. I love this picture. He would grow wheat for himself and his chickens and his family, right? And he would never put the wheat on the market, okay? This is the ominous-looking Claude Wicker, the Secretary of Agriculture. See these like these like charts in the background? It's a very five-year plan, right? So <laughs> he decided that Farmer Philbert should be growing this much wheat. It wasn't good for him, I guess. Whatever, right? He know, uh, Claude knows best. So he said, don't grow this wheat. OK, so Philbert goes, this is not interstate commerce. This wheat never leaves my farm. It's only for me. How does Congress have the power to regulate this wholly intrastate activity? And what did the Supreme Court hold? Well, his decision not to sell wheat impacts the interstate market. Okay, how? Well, if he were to sell his wheat, it would make prices different, and that dissipates the market. So his decision not to sell it raises prices in the interstate market. Therefore, Congress can regulate something that happens wholly within one state. Okay? This is what's been called the substantial effects doctrine, lots of names, but basically means that Congress has the power to regulate activity that does not cross state lines, right? So interstate commerce doesn't really mean interstate anymore. It really doesn't have to mean commerce anymore. It just means whatever you know the government wants to do. But that was the law. Okay. Fast forward to 2003. Now, what case is this? This one's tougher. Who knows what this is? Don't answer. This one might help better. What's it? What's this thing? Someone. Thank you, vaporizer. There's always people always timid to, to say that. What's what's a vaporizer used for? Thank you. It's for smoking marijuana, right? This is Angel Raich. Sound familiar? Gonzalez versus Raich, right? This was a medicinal marijuana case. So what was, what was her situation? She had a very advanced form of uh, some sort of tumor that was inoperable. And no treatment would help to alleviate her pain. The only thing that would help her was medicinal marijuana, which was legal under California law. But under federal law, it was not. Except now I guess if you're in Colorado or uh, Washington, no, you know, uh, take care of us, right? We'll put that aside from now. Anyway, so she used medicinal marijuana, and her pot was raided. So then she actually brought suit. She was represented by Randy Barnett, who was a co-author of my book, and went all the way to Supreme Court. Okay? And Randy said, listen, this case is different than uh, Wicker's. You know, there's no interstate marijuana market, right? This, this is just weed and seeds in one state, right? So this is a phone call of Angel Raich uh, finding out that she lost the case. So she lost, and she lost on two fronts. 6-3, so it wasn't even that close. So majority opinion of Justice Stevens, who said, I always get laughed at this line, her decision to use local marijuana impacts the interstate marijuana market. The interstate marijuana market. I don't know what that is. Silk Road, maybe, I don't know. But, but these, are the, these are the jurisprudential gymnastics that the courts to go through to make the rational basis that's work for the Commerce Clause. This is, this, is this is what flies from constitutional law nowadays, my friends. The interstate marijuana market, okay? Scalia did a different thing. He didn't necessarily proper. He said, well, Congress doesn't have the power to criminalize the drug trade. And as a necessary and proper incident of that power, they should be able to clamp down on local marijuana. You can't go to Whole Foods and buy it, okay? There's, they can't have locally grown marijuana. It's very, very non-history, okay? 
who wants marijuana for out state anyway? So, right. Anyway, so Raich lost. And that was their constitutional frame that we have this idea that Congress can regulate any kind of commercial activity, right? Commercial activity, what do you mean? Commercial activity. What happens if we're not talking about commercial activity? What if we're talking about in activity? And this is the argument advanced by Barnett and others. Okay. So there's two ways of looking at the situation. One, Congress is regulating the health insurance market, which is a multi-billion dollar market that impacts you know, every American in the world, right? If that's how you look at it, then yeah, the law is clearly a regulation of commerce. But what does the mandate do? Look at it a little bit differently. It's telling you that if you do not have health insurance, we're going to penalize you. We are now forcing Americans in this law for the first time ever to buy a commercial product under the commerce power. This had never been done. This, dare I say, is unprecedented, which is the name of the book. And this is a word that Randy repeated a bajillion times for the last five years, okay? Can Congress compel you to buy health insurance? Okay. Or here's another example. Can Congress make you buy broccoli? You don't have to eat it. If you use health insurance, you just have to buy it. You have to think about that. Okay? Can they make you buy broccoli? It'll make you healthier. Can they make you buy a gym membership? Gyms will make you healthier. You don't have to actually go. No one actually goes to the gym after February. Right? Can they make <laughs> Actually, it's funny. There's always lines at the gym in January. But in February, the gym's always totally empty. It's good. So can they make you buy broccoli, right? Can they make you buy a gym membership? <laughs> right about this one, right? General Motors is going bankrupt. You want to buy a new car. They say, you have to buy a GM vehicle. If you don't, we'll hit you with a $1,000 penalty. You're free to buy a Toyota. We'll hit you with a $1,000 penalty. Could they do that? Can Ten in the morning at the exact time. How long do you think it took for the first lawsuit to be filed? And that's only because Pacer sucks. Uh, <laughs> they have used ever used electronic filing in the federal courts. It's terrible, right? And it never works. So actually, there were two main lawsuits. One filed 17 minutes later. Another filed like another maybe 20 minutes after that. Okay. <laughs> There was a race to the courthouse. And they were racing because they knew the first one to file would probably go to the Supreme Court. Even like a few minutes difference, I guess that mattered, right? So the first suit was actually filed in Virginia by, I can now say, former Attorney General Ken Cuccinelli, uh, who is no longer in government. He's actually now representing Rand Paul in a class action suit against the NSA because why the hell not? Um, <laughs> why not, right? You know, what else is he going to do, right? Gay marriage is legal in Virginia. I mean, you know, what else is Cuccinelli going to do? So, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so we have Cuccinelli's suit, right? And in the Eastern District of Virginia, was the first to rule that the Obamacare mandate was unconstitutional. This was striking because up to this point, all law professors had laughed at this case. Everyone said this was going to be an easy case, and now you had a federal judge rule that the mandate was unconstitutional. This was an important turning point. They accepted the Barnett argument pretty clearly. So Obama was, was not happy with this, right? Because in addition to the law being struck down, its unpopularity remained. Uh, the laws was still being attacked at every angle. And people didn't like it, OK? But the main event was not in Virginia. It was in Florida. This is Judge uh, Henry, uh, uh, Fred Vinson. And the suit in Florida brought together initially attorneys general from 12 states, but ultimately, I think it was 23 or 24 states their attorneys general joined together and entered the suit. And I think this is probably the most states that oppose an act of Congress since like the Civil War. Uh, <laughs> you know, this was a, a, a striking instance where states came together to fight. Uh, by the way, if, for those Cooch haters, right? Cuccinelli broke off from the Florida suit. They were very mad at him because they didn't want to fracture your effort. And Cuccinelli had a defective suit because he lacked standing. So you can go hate, hate on that more. But anyway. What's even more remarkable is that Judge uh, uh, Vincent in Florida not only found that the mandate was unconstitutional, but the entire Affordable Care Act was unconstitutional. He compared it to a finely uh, worked uh, like a Swiss watch that you can't just take out the main gear you probably think would collapse. 
So he actually found the entire ACA unconstitutional. Um, the president was, could not have been happy with this because now we have a legitimate case. We're in 23 odd states. We now had a victory for the challengers. So off to the courts of appeals we go. Uh, most of the cases in the courts of appeals are argued by then acting Solicitor General Neil Katyal and, uh, and uh, legal wonder boy Paul Clement. Uh, if you haven't heard him argue, listen to him. He, he is simply remarkable. Okay? The first case was argued in the Sixth Circuit in Cincinnati. This is where I clerk, but my clerkship began after the case was argued um, and decided. So what was remarkable at this case was Judge Jeff Sutton, who's a conservative judge, ruled in favor of the government. So, so this was actually a signal that maybe this wasn't some sort of partisan issue that, you know, conservative judges would rule in favor of Obamacare. So this, this is my happy Obamacare picture. He's, he's my happy president. He's very happy here, right? But the main show was in Atlanta. This was the appeal from the Florida case. So in the 11th Circuit, we actually had Paul Clement and Neil Cotsiel going at it. And this was a case that brought together 23 states. And remarkably, we had a joint opinion from Judge Frank Hall and Chief Judge Dubina that actually found that the mandate was unconstitutional, right? We had a federal court of appeals in a very lengthy opinion with a, with a, with a divided dissent, right? Find that the ACA's mandate was un unconstitutional. Um, this gave us a circuit split, right? And what happened to the circuit split? The Supreme Court. It wasn't even a given at that point that the Supreme Court would take the case. It wasn't even a given, okay? Some people thought the Supreme Court would just you know, deny cert altogether like they've done with Guantanamo the last 15 years, okay? So, or something like that. So it wasn't even clear they'd take this case. But now with the circuit split, they had to take it. Okay? And, you know, we have to stop this. This is not good, okay? Next court of appeals is the Fourth Circuit, which is in Richmond, Virginia. And the court here did something a little bit weird, so I'm going to give you a little lesson on tax law, which I apologize for in advance, okay? In addition to the commerce power, Congress also has the power to lay and collect taxes for the general welfare, okay? If any of you ever received a paycheck, you've all seen your Social Security tax right on your paycheck. It's taken right out of your paycheck and put into this magical trust fund somewhere, right? Okay. The Supreme Court has upheld that power, that Congress can use a taxing power to fund these social welfare. There's no question about that. But when enacting the Affordable Care Act, the president made it that this was not a tax. He went on national television and said this is not a tax. Any Democrat interview said this is not a tax. In the statute itself, in the entire 27-page law, it was only called a penalty, right? Congress went out of the way to not call it a tax. Why? Well, the president made a campaign pledge of no new tax unless you're really rich or something, right? So only this would be applying to was for commerce power, right? And if you read the congressional findings of constitutionality, Whatever, right? We're, 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 we're all friends here. We'll, we'll use whatever basis we can to defend the law. It doesn't matter what action was said to, to pass. Okay, fine. But there's a problem with the tax and our argument. So who here knows what the Tax Anti-Injunction Act is? Anyone? Yes, sir. What's the Tax Anti-Injunction Act? You should pay the tax under protest and ensue. Exactly. So if the IRS assesses a tax to you and you don't like it, you have to pay it first under protest, and then you can go to a tax court and sue for a refund. In other words, you can't just sue for a tax right away. Can you imagine the, the, the chaos there would be if every time someone got a tax bill, you just go to court to challenge it? It'd be madness. So the courts actually lack jurisdiction. Well, in theory, the courts lack jurisdiction to hear tax suits before they're, they're, they're imposed. So when was the Obamacare tax to be imposed? What year? 2014. This was started in 2010, right? So by the very language of the Tax Anti-Injunction Act, Court can't hear until 2014. That's simple standing law, right? Okay. And the government initially they said this case is not right. And there were district courts actually tossed the thing it's not 2014 yet, no one's not standing. But the Obama administration made a decision, right? They didn't want to wait till 2014. Why? They might not be in office anymore. They wanted to implement the law. They didn't want to sit there for four years with this cloud hanging over it. So they decided to say a few things. It's a tax, but the Tax Anti-Injunction Act doesn't apply. How the heck can that be? Anyway, I'll come back to that later. But the Fourth Circuit bought the argument. They said, you know what? This is a tax, and because it's a tax, the, the Anti-Injunction Act applies. We can't hear it yet. OK, fine. President happy here. We have a new Solicitor General. This is Don Verrilli, OK? And when Verrilli came into office, 
shortly thereafter, the D.C. Circuit had oral arguments, and they decided the case. And there was an opinion by Judge Brett Kavanaugh, another conservative George Bush appointee, and he had, like, one sentence in his opinion that was really interesting. He said, listen, we all know this was not passed as a tax. Everyone, they didn't want it to be a tax. But what if we, like, pretend it was a tax? What if we change a few words here and there, right? You know, change a few words here, change a few words there. Change shall to may, you know, change penalty to tax, one of the most important damn words in the entire statute. But we change a few words here and there, this is a clearly constitutional tax, okay? That stuck in the mind of the SG. He started thinking, okay, how do we present this as a compelling argument that the, that the law is a tax, but we're not going to be stuck by the Anti-Injunction Act? Is that, that was the genius of Aurelia that almost everyone missed, in my, in my estimation. So we now have a circuit split, three courts of appeals upholding the law, and we go to the Supreme Court. Oh, doesn't they look all happy and smiling and cheerful, but not for long? Uh, because this case would divide the court unlike any other. And I think we need to uh, understand the context of how the court fits into politics in the Obama years. So who knows what this is a picture of? State of the Union. What happened to State of the Union when this picture was done? What happened? <laughs> he didn't actually wag his finger. Everyone remember what this was? Right. So this was the 2010... Uh, a State of the Union address, uh, maybe like two weeks after Citizens United was decided, and the president makes all these statements that were totally false. He says, this case will open the floodgates of foreign spending, it will reverse a hundred years of Supreme Court jurisprudence, blah, blah, blah. If you actually read just, uh, then Solicitor General Kagan's brief, she admits those things are both false, but it doesn't matter, demagoguery, right? So as he's saying this, Justice Alito, I guess, forgot he was not in Supreme Court, and he forgot there were cameras there, right? So as he was on camera, he broke the card of roll, he said, saying, not true, not true. FYI, Justice Alito has not been back to a state of the union since then. He wasn't there last week. Uh, <laughs> Scalia and Thomas haven't gone in over a decade, and Judge Sotomayor was selling her book, so she didn't go either. Okay. <laughs> By the way, Gore was going in the deal. <laughs> Biden was scheduled to be sworn in the afternoon, and because Sotomayor was going in the daily show, she became him scheduled at like 8 in the morning. <laughs> Priorities, right? Anyway. But I think this episode is instructive because it shows that the president was not afraid to criticize the court when they ruled against him. Even though, which candidate benefited the most from Citizens United? This guy, right? He benefited much more than anyone else from Citizens United. Well, well whatever, it doesn't matter. We got we to we pose this. So, we go to the Supreme Court. Has everyone been to the Supreme Court, a lot of you? Everyone been to arguments? Has anyone been to the Supreme Court without tickets? and waited outside. My friend, how long did you wait? Uh, it was just for an opinion announcement, but it was uh, about five hours. Five hours, we'll win. Right. So, you know, there are no cameras in the court. The only way to get in is way outside. So from McDonald's to Chicago, this was a big gun case a couple years ago. I think I waited, let's see, from 7 p.m. I waited about 13 hours outside, okay? And it's not quite as cold in Washington as it is here in Minnesota. I gave this talk in Arizona last week. I'm like, oh my god, it's 30 degrees. Like, that'd be nothing for you. But standing outside all night gets pretty cold. And uh, uh, a pro tip, right? At 3 in the morning, the sprinklers come on, even in March, which is a very nice wake-up call. So actually, for the Obamacare case, the number one person is hours on the street. And you can see the tarps, because it was actually sleeting and snowing that, 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 that weekend in Washington. It was very cold. But argument day came, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll set it up for you. So there were three days of oral argument, OK? Day number one was a tax and power, an anti-injunction act power. Could Congress impose this tax, and could they uh, get around the anti-injunction act, okay? Day two was commerce. Could Congress impose this mandate under its commerce power, okay? Day three was a double header. In the morning, they looked at whether Congress could, um, was over the mandate could be severed from the rest of the law, and in the afternoon, it was with the Medicaid expansion power. Okay? Who wants to go? Just, just, just go for it. Don't feel embarrassed, okay? So, day one, the SG had a very difficult task, okay? What was the task? The task was to persuade somehow the court that the individual mandate, okay, was a tax for purposes of the Constitution, but not a tax for purposes of the Anti-Injunction Act. Let me say it again. 
The same law would be attached for purposes of the Constitution that we passed, but not attached to the Tax Anti Injunction Act. In other words, they could hear the case now before 2014, but it was also attached because it was constitutional. And how did the SC do this? By persuading the court that there was. Penalty. It's like the tribes are chief justice, they're just attacked on having insurance. And they ask the challengers, what happens, right? What happens if there's no penalty? What happens if there's no man? It's easy to rule against them. The government wins at that point. Okay? So this was day one when no one was paying attention. It was on this ground that the court would have pulled the law. So day two was on the commerce power, and the SG got up to a rough start uh, because he had actually taken a glass of water and went down the wrong pipe. And he was choking on it for about eight seconds, Sunny audio. Didn't get much better after that. So the commerce power became very difficult because he had to realize that there has to be a limiting principle. The court asked, what's your limiting principle, OK? The problem was he could not give a limiting principle. He could not answer the broccoli hypothetical, OK? And I'll speed through the angst and see people are, are slowly trickling out. Yeah? People are being rude. There's a legal weighing requirement for one else. Oh, I, no, I understand. I understand. That's cool. I, I was once giving a talk at a school, I won't say which one, and they scheduled me from 1230 to 1. So Paul Clement did a wonderful job, and we all know he's great. So the case was argued, submitted, and we all thought that Justice Voldemort would have the deciding vote, right? He would, <laughs> Kennedy, sorry, that, that he would that he would decide how the case should be decided. But it wasn't to be Justice Kennedy. It would be this doughy-eyed John Roberts gazing into, into the into the netherlands of his of his uh, saving constructions. Right? The court actually decided the case, right? Exactly as the government told them to. In a weird opinion, the Supreme Court began and said, Robert said, yeah, this law is not constitutional as the Commerce Clause, but I'm going to apply a saving construction, right? The actual law itself is not a tax, right? But I'm going to believe the law is a tax in order to save you. And in order to make believe the law is a tax, I'm going to pretend that there's no actual penalty. Like that word shall, I'm going to pretend that's not there. And the word penalty, I'll pretend that's also not there. The Chief Justice upheld a statute that Congress never passed. The law Roberts upheld was one that was never actually enacted. Okay? He actually, John Roberts created the biggest. That, that's a net effect. Um, and according to Roberts, there's no mandate. So none of you have to buy insurance. Is that awesome? But if you don't buy insurance, you pay, pay tax. Whatever, right? We had a joint, dis, uh, it wasn't quite a dissent, but a joint opinion from Kennedy, Thomas, Alito, and uh, 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 Scalia, which would found the entire AC unconstitutional, top to bottom. Uh, we have a lovely uh, descent from just bring us back to the uh, law here court and you know, just just go full in wicked overturn, right? Interestingly enough, uh, uh, we had a, a, an opinion from Justices at Ginsburg and Sotomayor, which found that the entire law was wonderful and it's the greatest thing ever. We love Obamacare, right? But what was funny though was the coverage of the case. Now we all know there are no cameras in the court. And as a preview of things to come, the Supreme Court's website crashed on decision day. Yeah, that actually happens, right? So the only way to get actually a copy of the opinion was to actually send it with a piece of paper, you know, to hand to, hand to the reporter. So CNN, right, Wolf Blitzer's live. And they go to a reporter on the street, on one first street in front of the court. And you can see her reading from page three of the syllabus, right? And on page three of the syllabus, it says, the Chief Justice finds that it violates the Commerce Clause, right? 
So she tells this to Wolf Blitzer, and Wolf Blitzer goes wall to wall, the entire CNN infrastructure, the entire world reports, right? Guess who's watching CNN? <laughs> <laughs> For like eight minutes, the leader of the free. He's like the law was struck down. This is stunning, right? Fox News also screwed up. You can actually Megyn Kelly, like looking at Scott's blog and iPhone, uh, I think Scott's blog is saying something else. But anyway, if Kate Baldwin had turned to page four, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if she had turned to page four of the syllabus, right? She would have seen where it said, but applying the saving construction, the, the court upholds the law. Right? She had turned to page four, too many pages, for you, right? So this is our do it defeat the Truman moment. And eventually the president found out that he won. One of his staffers walked into his office to give him a thumbs up. He's like, I thought we lost. He's like, no, you won, you won. He was sitting there by himself watching cable news. It's actually kind of sad. Um, <laughs> MSNBC said nothing, so they got they didn't get they, they were proud they said nothing. That, that was their opinion. Okay. So I think in the end the SG was vindicated. Uh, the Chief Justice, I mean Randy Burnett's much tougher on him than I am, but I think the Chief Justice had to shred uh, the law to uphold it. Uh, he was lambasic, Lambeck called him a coward, okay? But now let's talk a little bit about the politics, and we'll wrap up with this, right? Minutes after the case was decided, this guy, whatever his name was, Mittens, right, he, he held a press conference, right, saying, I think he was running for president, I can't remember anymore. Uh, he was running for president and said, we need to repeal Obamacare, which is really funny because he created the damn thing in Massachusetts, right? This is his baby. And in fact, whenever he debated with Obama, the president, right, the president would always say, Romney care. I used to think that, you know, Romney's defeat was the end of the Obamacare fight, which is why I thought my book would be the final version. But after, oh, I would love to hear what they said this inauguration. Be like, thanks, buddy, right? But, you know, I thought that the story ended here. We had a chief justice and the president looking, you know, forward. He has like three years left to his term. Doesn't really know what he's going to accomplish. So many executive orders are signed, right? We don't even know. We're, we're, you know forget laws, right? We'll bypass Congress. And we have the chief justice looking forward, forward to the left, as it seems. Uh, uh, trying to say what else can we do? We do the Voting Rights Act, or of action, abortion. So he's been playing the long game, right? This is where I used to end the talk, but now I end it here. When my when my my dear junior senator, Senator Ted Cruz, decided to shut down the federal government and read his children green eggs and ham uh, as a way to shut down Obamacare. Remember this? Did, did anyone in Minnesota actually feel the shutdown? Yes. Yes. Good. We interned in the Civil Rights Clinic, and we weren't allowed to come into our internships for two weeks, and so I'm worried about losing class credit if you can't make it up. Okay. Yeah. So we have here the barricades. Remember this? So we had actually a government shutdown where people were impacted as a result of Obamacare, right? The next phase, of course, was the website, right? Healthcare.gov. And this, this is poor Adrian. And poor Adrian didn't actually get paid to use her photograph here. In fact, she took free headshots as a way to get, you know, get the photographs for herself. She actually got harassed and bullied afterwards, which is, which is sad. But um, after the website launched, right, it didn't do very well. And it did so poorly that people spent hours upon hours upon hours trying to sign up. Do you know how many people actually signed up on day number one? Six. Six people signed up on day number one. But in fairness, the president made a pledge that he'll get it fixed by December 1st. Uh, he had to because people had to sign up at the end of the year. And by and large, the website's working now. So I think the website would be a nice one to talk about, but, but it's recovered. But I think the more important issue to going forward are these. These are the cancellation notices. And here we get to kind of the nub of Obamacare, right? The winners and the losers. And there are certain people who will definitely be better off from Obamacare. They, they will, right? But what is the cost of helping those people? And could those people be helped at a lower cost? So as a result of Obamacare, the estimates were between 5 and maybe 15 million people would be kicked off their policies and being forced into the exchanges. And some might get better plans, some might get worse. But the initial promise of this law was, if you like your policy, you can keep it. This was a promise made thousands of times, and each time it was an utter lie. Okay? The president knew that promise can be kept because the very nature of the law forces people off their nice, simple plan into the expensive governance uh, uh, endorsed plans. Okay. Next year. Ne actually, October 2014, the next round of cancellation notices kick in. Why? Because the president unilaterally delayed the business mandate, right? Businesses were not required to give insurance this year because he said, nah, I'm not ready for it. Do it next year after the election, right? But as a result of this, we have a lot more of these cancellation notices sent out. And we've had Kathleen Sebelius testify in front of Congress. She said, blame me. She's still on a job, right? One minute on Hobby Lobby. So this is the contraceptive mandate case, right? This is the issue of can Congress compel 
employers which are religious to provide contraceptives to their employees. Okay? This will be argued in about a month, and this tees up a couple interesting issues. One, corporations exercise religion under RIFRA, but two, even if they can, does the mandate to provide contraceptives actually burden that religion? This will be a tricky case. So this is a condensed tour of all of Obamacare's legal issues in less than 43 minutes. And I, I appreciate those of you can stick around. And uh, uh, I, I welcome any questions after the conference. So thank you very much. Uh, some very quick comments on uh, Josh's excellent talk and, and excellent book uh, before uh, we open up for, for questions. Um, I have a couple things that I'd like to say about uh, Josh's project, what he wrote about, but also just the way he wrote um, what he wrote. Um, first of all, this is a very underappreciated method of legal writing, which is a case study, not a case about, not a, not a note or a um, blog post or whatever about um, how, what happened in the case, what the holding was, who the parties were but a behind-the-scenes story about how a case came about. Now, the most famous of this, I think, is the um, Gideon's Trumpet, about the case Gideon versus Wainwright, where this pro se guy went all the way up to the Supreme Court and um, gave uh, everyone the right to, uh, to an attorney when they're criminally prosecuted. Uh, there's many other examples of this, but uh, I, perhaps outside the legal community, I think people don't, don't know the the and, and in the legal community the uh, the drama that you can get out of writing out a case. I mean, there's there's drama right there because it's a lawsuit, parties that 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 are fighting each other. There's all kinds of players in it: the, the judges, the people on the outside, that's often the press in a in a big case. And so there's lots and lots of fodder there to write about. And if any of you are ever thinking of an article you'd like to write or a bigger project, um, I encourage you to to look into some case that has the, the whole story hasn't been told. There's all kinds of famous cases where everyone knows what the holding was, everyone knows the parties, but there's very little known about what the, you know, why the lawyers did what they did or why the parties were there in the, in the first place. Um, on the whole history of the Affordable Care Act litigation, I played a very small part. I think I wrote an op-ed once that said that the law was unconstitutional. Um, of course, there were about 2,000 other op-eds of, of that kind. Uh, but that's an example of what we do at the Institute for Justice when we do a case. Uh, we actually didn't file any lawsuits about Obamacare. We just did a, a brief at the Supreme Court. Um, but when we do a case, we do media, we get the, the message out there, we do YouTube videos, we go on social media, we do all this stuff because, we one, we want to educate the public about what the issue is that has that just been filed in court, and why uh, there's a law out there that should be ruled unconstitutional, and why it affects people's real lives, and uh, whether it's the First Amendment, or the right to earn a living, or eminent domain, or whatever our, our case is about. But we also do that because we realize that even though this case is just going to be go, go before one human being, a judge, and then maybe three on a, on a panel, and if we're lucky, on to a, a Supreme Court, um, the, those judges watch the same TV shows that the public does, and those judges read the same op-eds and, and articles. Um, I clerked for a judge at a state Supreme Court, and you know we talk about what's going on out there. And once I wrote an op-ed in a local paper, and I hadn't told him about it, and he, he read it in the paper and, and talked to me about my op-ed. So judges can even maybe not be influenced by legal arguments that you put out there, like just my op, I don't think, you know, John Roberts wrote, read my op-ed in the Daily Caller, but um, because they're out, this is a big deal. People care about this. Well, half the country hates this law. How could I, you know, rule one way or, or, or the other? Um, and so if all is file a lawsuit, never tell anyone about it, and convince the judge that the, the, the facts of the case and your arguments should compel them to rule, uh, rule for you, in this kind of situation, that might not be enough. And so you need to show that it's important because the judge on his way home, he's going to see a billboard or he's going to see a newspaper headline about the very case that he's adjudicating and realize, well, this is a case that I should actually you know, come in early and read the briefs. Um, and it's that, and that was more than any other case of our lifetime. That was true in the Obamacare litigation, and that's um, why it ended up the way it did, and why it's still somehow um, being fought out there. 
So, um, questions for uh, for Josh? Yes, sir, in the front. Yeah, thank you. So I'm curious about the uh, the difference between an individual mandate, you must go buy this, mm -hmm. versus use of the tax and spend power. The state will buy this for you. I. What's the difference between the two as far as? The well, it was, the state wasn't buying anything for people. People had to buy it themselves, right? So the difference is, can Congress make you buy something, and if you don't, you pay a penalty, versus can Congress tax you for not doing something, right? You see the difference? And the Chief Justice accepted the distinction. He said, even though the law says nothing about taxes, we will treat it as if you're taxing people for not doing something. And the taxing power is very broad. We all pay Social Security tax as a function of being alive and working, right? This is even a bigger stretch because this doesn't even have to work. As long as if you're an, if you're a human being in existence, and you meet certain income qualifications, you now have to pay for this tax, and that that had never been done before. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I mean, even something like the Vermont health system nationwide would have been easier to justify. Yes. Use the so it's interesting is and Randy Barnett's on record saying this. I know this in the book. Single payer for all Medicaid for all have been totally constitutional. So the fact that he tried to do something funky, conservative, free market-ish, but not really, got him in trouble, right? It's, it's one of the ironies of the entire law. Had they just went full bore social, uh, you know, single payer, maybe Richard Epps would find a taking, but you know, the, the taxing argument would be, probably be a, a, a clear-cut winner. Other questions? Yes, sir? I'm wondering about the Commerce, commerce Clause for the Is that uh, refusal to uphold that the Commerce Clause can have the effects down the road? Okay, so this is, this is an important question, right? So I didn't go too much into the details, but the Roberts opinion found that the mandate violates well, the Commerce Clause. We had four votes from Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito that agreed. Scalia and Kennedy and Thomas never cited the Roberts opinion, but their effects are on the same page. So what impact does this have going forward? Doctrinally, not much, right? So Congress can't enact the purchase mandate, right? If they make you buy broccoli or make you buy a GM vehicle, that's probably not good. But I think on a more meta level, this is important. Because it signals that the federalism revolution from the 90s with the rank was courts is continuing, right? People weren't exactly sure where Roberts stood on these issues. He had an opinion in Comstock and other cases of him kind of waffly. We know now that Roberts is willing to stand up on federalism grounds. He caved on the ultimate issue, but we know that he, you know, he's in the game. I think just doctrinally, that means a lot going forward of where the court is about respecting enumerated powers. Yes, sir. Um. Right after the opinion came out, there were some reports in the press that I remember Dan Crockett and yeah. Reaver uh, did some reporting about what actually happened behind the scenes and, and, and the conservatives were really mad at the chief and they were shouting matches, I can't remember what they said, but, which is very unusual because that's the kind of thing you would only know or you didn't know it in, if you were in the Supreme Court chamber. She wasn't the only one who knew that. So, well, and, and I'll, I'll, where did, did you talk about in the book or do you, yes. maybe you can't reveal the sources, I understand, but um, do you know who those people were and how, how was that? So, so he, here's what I'll say. I'm, I'm totally going to dodge your question, but here's what I'll say, right? The stuff that Jan Crawford knew, a lot of people knew. And she published that report like July 1st. People knew what she knew in like April, okay? So I talk about this in the book. You can go buy a copy if you want to read, read in details. But at some point, so the, the case was argued March 26th through the 29th, and they had a conference that Friday, right? And the conference, from what I've heard, was the Chief Justice was basically saying, you know what, I'm with you on striking the law down the Commerce Clause grounds. But he was kind of wavering or wobbly with respect to the taxing power. At some point in April, it became clear that he was going to pull those attacks, okay? And the other justices started reacting to them. They started writing opinions, trying to persuade him. But this wasn't some effort, as Jan Cropper said, that they wrote this at the last minute. That wasn't what happened. But knew that the chief was wobbly did leak out of the court. And there were people in Washington who learned about this, and they were reacting to this. We had actually a number of op-eds from George Will and Kathleen Park and others telling John Roberts to grow a backbone, to grow a spine, to not let Obama intimidate him, right? And, and I can say that they were acting on intelligence. This wasn't just idle speculation. I'll say one more interesting element. So the Monday after the press conference, so the Monday after the uh, conference at the Supreme Court, the president held an impromptu press conference, right? And what was interesting was the president made some comments off the record, no teleprompter, any kind of remarks, where he said, I swear to God, it would be, quote, unprecedented for the court to strike this law down. The court must exercise their jurisprudence carefully. Okay? He compared an opinion striking down the law to Lochner. Okay? We had a sitting U.S. president talking about Lochner. Okay? So there was a lot of swirling pressure in Washington from both sides. 
And a lot of it, I don't know, all of it, but a lot of those actions formed by stuff from the court. I'm going to dodge the rest of your question. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Right, I mean, and, and the economic arguments in favor of Obamacare make a lot of sense, right? I'm not, I'm not an economics guy. I'm a constitutional law guy, right? So there are lots of arguments that make a lot of sense for our policy that are unconstitutional. And that's where this case was decided. Okay, other questions? I know you all have class. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. Stay warm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.